Hi, good evening, everyone. Hi, Fiona. Hi, good evening. I'm Fiona Coffey, Associate Director for Programming and Performing Arts at Wesleyan University's Center for the Arts. It's my great privilege to welcome you to this year's virtual Navaratri Festival. This is the second of three live events. Tomorrow evening, please join us at 7 p.m. for a conversation with dancer choreographers Ananya Chatterjee and Professor Hari Krishnan. The Navaratri Festival is made possible by the generosity of the dance and music departments at Wesleyan, as well as the Madhu Reddy family. And thank you so much to the staff at the Center for the Arts for helping produce this yearly event. You guys are amazing. This year's festival is dedicated to the iconic singer, S.P. Bala Subramanian, who passed away on September 25th due to COVID-19. Balu Sir was one of India's most celebrated artists, and this dedication is a testimony to his unique ability to unite South Asia and South Asians in truly interconnected ways, transcending language, ethnicity, caste, class, and more. I am joined this evening by our moderator, Bianca Iannati, PhD student in ethnomusicology. Bianca received her BA in music from Wheaton College, where she studied with Wesleyan alumni and ethnomusicologists, Matthew Allen and Julie Searless. In the spring of 2019, she received her MA from Wesleyan University and continues to work with Professor B. Balu Subramanian and her PhD, uh, sorry, her PhD advisor, ethnomusicologist, Professor Suzang. Bianca is a classically trained opera singer and has started her formal Bharatanatyam training in the T. Balasaraswati style under the instruction of Dr. Saski Kersen Boom and presently with Anine uh, de Groot Singh. Thank you, Fiona. Um, I'm delighted to mo moderate tonight's conversation with activist, ethnomusicologist, and director of Shakti Vibrations, Zoe Shirinian, public interest folklorist, ethnomusicologist, and Tamil music scholar, Aaron Page, and of course, Carnatic vocalist, Tamil music scholar, and adjunct associate professor of music here at Wesleyan, B. Balasubramaniam. So first and foremost, thank you all for attending tonight's evening and hopefully you're all able to watch the documentary, but if not, not to worry. Um, I just wanna remind you that the video is actually gonna be up available to stream until October 7th. So there's still some time to check it out. Um, but for now, I can provide a little bit of some context. So Shakti Vibrations is a participatory ethnomusicological documentary that centers around the Shakti Folk Se Cultural Center in Tamil Nadu, India. Led by two progressive Catholic nuns, the Shakti Center's one-year program aims to develop the self-esteem and economic skills of young Dalit women through Tamil folk arts, specifically the pare drum. Now, at this time, I would like to invite Balu to share with us some brief history and an overview of the significance of the Navaratri Festival here at Wesleyan. Balu? Oh, Bali, you have to um, unmute yourself. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Bianca. Uh, Bianca has been a TA uh, since she, uh, she joined here at Wesleyan. I'm very pleased to join in this discussion with our uh, own Wesleyan alumnus, French ethno ethnomusicologist, Zoe Sherinian and Aaron Page, who's a scholar and fine Murdangam artist. Uh, Navratri is an Indian festival celebrating the victory of good over evil. And throughout India, this holiday is recognized with the grand festivities, parades, music and dance performances, and delicious food. Each of the nine nights of the festival honors a different aspect of Goddess Durga, a manifestation of Parvati, Shiva's concert. On the ninth day, educational materials, musical instruments, tools, and vehicles are decorated and dedicated to Goddess Saraswati, Goddess of Education, in a worship ceremony. Vijay Dasami, the 10th day following uh, the ninth, day, ninth night, is dedicated to Durga and is a day for students to honor their teachers of the arts and to learn a new song or dance. At this time, I would like to thank Professor Joseph Getter for providing ample information about Wesleyan Navratri in his MA thesis. 
uh, Navratri was first celebrated informally at Wesleyan in 1967. Two years later, it became a nine-night Indian music festival organized by Professor Robert Brown. Navratri has been an annual event at Wesleyan since 1976 under the direction of faculty members, Professors T. Vishwanathan and Professor T. Ranganathan. The pioneers T. Vishwanathan and T. Ranganathan built the early American audiences through many years of instruction and performance in the United States. Some of the most talented and best musicians and dancers of India have performed in the, in the festivals, including artists of the both Carnatic and Hindustani music, such as M. S. Subhalakshmi, Dr. M. Balamurli Krishna, Lalgudi Jairaman, Hari Prasad Chaurasia, Ali Akbar Khan, and the great dancers such as T. Bhala Saraswati uh, and uh, Bruju Maharaj and so on. This tradition is continuing under the guidance of uh, Wesleyan faculty members, Professor David Nelson, Professor Ari Krishnan, and myself. It is very appropriate to have Shakti vibrations to celebrate Navratri festival at Wesleyan since this festival is all about women's power known as Shakti. This is a brief uh, introduction of Navratri festival at Wesleyan. Thank you, Bianca. Thank you so much, Balu. So before we start our evening, uh, we want to acknowledge that at Wesleyan Center for the Arts, we believe that one of the roles of the arts is to make the invisibilized visible. We also believe that it is not the responsibility of those who have been made invisible to remind us that they are still here. Therefore, as committed allies, we wish to acknowledge the respective grounds on which our institution and our visiting artists are present here tonight. Wesleyan is located on the traditional lands of the Wagunk, and our guests are joining us from the traditional lands of the Caddo Nation, the Wichitas, as well as the hunting grounds of the Apache, the Comanche, the Kiowa, and the Osage Nations of Oklahoma, and the Narragansett people of Rhode Island. We honor their lands, waterways, and ancestors, past, present, and future, and we recognize their continued existence and contributions to our society. We also recognize and acknowledge those who did not come to this land by choice. All who come here are welcome in this space today. So a few notes before we begin this evening, please feel free to put questions into the chat on Facebook or YouTube throughout the evening and we'll answer them towards the end. Um, you may see some delays or video stuttering, which is normal for streaming events. Um, any tech issues, please just post a comment on Facebook or YouTube and we will try to help you out the most we can. Um, and with that, I'm just going to turn the evening over to Bianca and our esteemed guests. Thank you so much, Bianca. Thank you. Um, so before we begin, um, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our very own Wesleyan alumna, Dr. Zoe Sherinian. Now, Dr. Sherinian is professor of ethnomusicology at the University of Oklahoma with research interests in Christian indigenization, percussion, and intersectionality between caste, class, and gender, activist ethnomusicology, and ethnomusicological film. Sherinian is an active musician who performs and conducts trainings on the pare drum, plays the mrdangam, and jazz drum set. She received her master's and PhD from Wesleyan University, studying primarily with T. Vishwanathan, Ramnad Raghavan, Mark Slobin, Kay Chalamet, and Gage April. And in 2014, she published her book, Dhamma Folk Music as Dalit Liberation Theology, and was the co-editor of the 2017 book, Making Congregational Music Local, Indigenous Songs and Cosmopolitan Styles in the Music of Global Christianity. And other recent publications include articles for three of the Oxford Handbook series, included Applied Ethnomusicology, Christian Music, and the lead article in the 2019 book, Queering the Field, Sounding Out Ethnomusicology, edited by Bars and Cheng. And Zoe has also produced and directed two documentary films. This is a music, Reclaiming an Untouchable Drum, which was filmed in 2011, and of course, um, the focus of tonight's um, event, Shakti Vibrations, that will serve um, basically as the main discussion. Um, and Zoe, I'd just like to take it up to you now. Thank you so much. It's really an honor uh, to be part of this Wesleyan Navaratri after having seen so many of them as a student. Um, and I'm just thrilled that, that 
Navaratri is bringing Tamil folk music to the forefront through uh, Screening My Film. And thank you so much, Bianca. I'd like to thank the organizers of this event, uh, Wesleyan University Center for the Arts, Hari Krishnan, uh, Bala, Bala, uh, Bala Subramaniam, Bianca, and the staff, particularly Fiona, Hannah, Bob, and their team. And I also want to acknowledge my um, filmmaking team, my cinematographer for the second half of the film, Varsha Yeshwant Kumar. For the first half, my cinematographers and co-directors were Tain Mori Sondarajan and Tani Ikeda. And my, my um, editor was Sundance fellow Jeff Palmer, as well as Adam, Adam Ropp and Barnaby Bristol what did the sound sweetening and Brandon Seekins did the coloring. And last but not least, the subjects and co-creators of my film, the women of Shakti Folk Cultural Center in Tamil Nadu. I'd like to just do a brief introduction of the film, sort of a synopsis of it. So this film is an ethnomusicological documentary about the Shakti Folk Cultural Center in Tamil Nadu, India, where the Tamil folk arts are used to develop self-esteem and economic skills in young, poor Dalit women. So Dalit is the self-chosen term used for people formerly called untouchables or outcasts. But the students of Shakti are really quadruply oppressed. They're caste oppressed Dalits, they're women, they're poor, and they're all high school dropouts. So this is a participatory documentary which shows how Shakti reclaims the degraded parai drum of the Dalits of, of Tamil Nadu. Um, this is a drum traditionally played by men. Let me just show it to you really quickly. And you can see it's a frame drum and it's got a very thick wooden frame and a thick skin made out of not cow hide, but buffalo hide. And it's played with two sticks and, and we'll see more of it later. Um, so this parai is used to rehumanize and empower the young trainees through the physical embodiment of confidence in performance and a kind of regenerated cultural identity in a complex campaign, campaign against gender, class and caste subjugation. And in the film, I try to reveal and analyze Shakti's outstanding model for Dalit women's development that integrates folk arts performance with social analysis, microeconomic skill building, self-esteem and community development. And, and another really fun part of it is that the film editing experimentally weaves together interviews, performance and development activities such as tailoring, basket making, along with a short film shot by the students themselves as they actively define their process of growth and contribute to this participatory documentary. And we're gonna just play the introduction to the film, which is kind of like a trailer. Um, we'll just play it now and then we'll uh, continue our conversation.
என் பேர் கற்பகம் என்னுடைய பேர் வந்து சௌமியா என் பேர் மெர்சி என் பேர் கவிதா நான் ஒரு தலித் பெண் நான் வந்து தலித் சமூகத்தை சேர்ந்த பொண்ணு இது என்னுடைய கதை இது வந்து என்னுடைய கதை நான் ஒரு தலித் சேர்ந்த பொண்ணு நீ என் கதையை சொல்ல போகிறேன் Dalit means uh, broken people. They are not allowed to be a human. They are broken. In the Shakti context, I would say Dalit means the people of the earth. They are the land owners bhumi taaye engal satti taaye bhumi taaye engal satti taaye and the art is this yes. i always say in tamil mannin kaligal avai makkal kaligal is the art of the earth is art of the people so who are the people of the earth they are the dalit people okay so we got a little taste of that wow yeah it's just amazing um i was wondering um if maybe you could just provide a little bit of context um like how did you learn about the shakti folk cultural center and maybe just provide a little bit of history of um why and how it was created and also of course um especially for us graduate students that are listening in um why did you choose this to be um the focus of your film and your research yeah so how i came to shakti was really similar to the way many ethnomusicologists do uh through networking from my previous project first my my dissertation project and then my first film so my dissertation project was on the indigenization of tamil christian music at um and i was doing that field work at a place called the Tamil Nadu Theological Center uh, sorry seminary in Madurai and there they were they were using this padai drum in their christian services and they also conducted a dalit arts festival and that's where i first found out about the drum and was really attracted to it and shakti was coming to this arts festival and that went from um let me see like 1995 for about 8 years it started and then in 2008 i decided to uh i wanted to make a a film on this parai and i thought i would focus on traditional male players and this is just something to know that that women did not play the parai until shakti started their organization so it's been like 30 years of that um so i wanted to focus on on a male group in a really typical village um in order to understand their their changing status and the changing status of this drum but i also wanted to look at various ngo groups like shakti and another group called the buddhist art group and so i actually spent 3 days with shakti at the time and filmed them and found out a lot about their program but ultimately when i was editing my first film this is a music i decided that i could only put little bits of these ngo groups in and i realized that shakti deserved their own film um so after i finished that when i started working on on doing a film just on shakti um uh, let me just talk a little bit about the center and and their skill building um purpose and message. So so the issue here is that when young people have their self-esteem trampled on from experience lots of of failures um simply teaching microeconomic skills is is likely to be unsex, uh, unsuccessful. So so the arts when taught with loving patience can get at the emotional pain of oppression. And and so Shakti uses this kind of holistic teaching method to build self-confidence, community, unity among the 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 group of women and leadership skills. So they start with the folk arts and then they move to to teaching these young girls 
um, tailoring sort of microeconomic skills that they could use when they go back to the village, tailoring, basket weaving, food preparation, et cetera. But they also train, they also tutor them to finish their um, 10th grade and 12th grade exams. Um, so in our process of shooting, um, in my process of in shooting and editing, making this film, um, I wanted to to show that message, but to not be saying it, to just be showing it visually. And so I'm going to play you another clip here that, that shows this kind of fading technique of going from, let's say, um, dancing feet that are just starting to, to learn how to, to just do the basic takadimi kind of thing, going to feet on a, um, a tailoring pedal. And we go back and forth between these. And I'm trying to show the connection between, so almost the embodied connection between these, the skill learning. So let's go ahead and play that clip. Ready, start. Okay, so you get it. I want to thank Jeff Palmer for his amazing editing of that of that vision that I had. Um, he did an amazing job in there. So, so we did like three periods of shooting uh, with Shakti. One was in you know, two months in the summer, and then in in the middle of the year in the winter, and then again for a few weeks in the spring. And what I'm trying to show in this film is the gradual embodiment of self-esteem and to you know, show that physicalness from go, these girls going from you know, barely be able, being able to walk in time from a sense of, of self-conscious self-reflection to really a, a sense of motor skills habituation. And I'm drawing concepts from phenomenology here. Um, so I want to show a, a, a performance of theirs after just two months of practice and a lot of loving uh, of support in the in their teaching. So let's just play a little bit of the first performance. From So you can see there that that they're still a little awkward. The lines and the circles aren't quite straight yet, and and they're still coming into their bodies. But but by the end of the year, if you are able to watch the film, you'll see just an amazing tight choreography and and just amazing strength in these women. Wow! Thank you. Um, so I was just wondering, could you maybe provide just a little bit more context as to 
why the students of the Shakti Center have dropped out. So is this common, um, particularly for females in the Dalit community, not to finish their education? Mm -hmm. Yes, so I would say the Dalit village girls and boys in this area of South India, in the last generation or so, typically finish, they get up to about the eighth grade or eighth standard, as they say, or perhaps the 10th grade. Uh, fewer finish 12th and or go on to college. Um, but this has definitely improved significantly in the last generation. I've seen that compared to the, the um, village drummer, male drummers that I worked with. Um, so I, I want to show you a little bit more of this through um, a participatory vi video training that we did with them um, that, that shows a little bit more of, of, of the reason why they dropped out and their own feelings about it. So this uh, training that was led by um, Sondrajan and Ikeda involved exercises to develop their stories, storyboarding, writing out a script, techniques for shooting choices and acting out their own stories. And then they actually, with the cameras that we gave them, they shot the footage and did some editing. And what we've done is we put this five minute film that these girls shot in the middle of our documentary. And through this process, we came to understand that the common experience of internalized oppression for these students was this sense of failure from being a high school dropout. You know, more so in some ways, you know, they're totally interconnected, their 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 dullness and their being women, et cetera. But but what that was really on their minds were the fact that they had dropped out of they had failed high school. So um so I'm gonna play for you uh the the part of the film that they made, which we've named Darshini's Journey. And this is the story of Darshini, one of the the girls in the school who struggles to pass her exam and she threatens to drop out of school. Her working class mother begs her not to quit saying she spent so much money on her exam fees and the other students laugh at her and Kavita, one of the trainers who, who plays the teacher here, scolds her as she sleeps in class and is publicly reprimanded for her low grades. Then another student, Davy, comes along and volunteers to help Darshini study, which is really what the the you know the metaphor here for um, what the center is all about, and the result is is um, very positive results of higher grades and praise from her teacher. So let's play uh, Darshini's journey. We're not going to play all of it, and then I want to talk a little bit about the issue of performance and performativity. Okay, so that's just a little bit of it. Go, it goes on, 
And um, you can see the kind of intensity that these students face uh, in class. Um, so, so I want to talk about this issue of performance and performativity and this the technique that we're really using in the theory that I'm trying to bring into this. So the, the three characters that we see here is Darshini, uh, the student who is, is failing, the teacher Kavita and her friend Devi. And so all of these, these actresses are playing themselves. The experience of success that Darshini ultimately acts out, that she performs, in the drama contributes to her self-transformation, her self-actualization, her performativity of success in real life. So Darshini has struggled the most in real life of girls at the center to pass her school exams. Thus this dialogical filmmaking process provides Darshini a performed or embodied experience of success that I argue contributes towards an actualized performativity of passing. She transforms her identity from oppressed outcast to habitual succeeder. And in real life, after making this film, she eventually passed her exams. Yeah. So, That's wonderful. Yeah. So an another participatory video mm -hmm. technique that we contributed to Shakti was the iPad. And um, I'm gonna show a, a PowerPoint of some photos from this. Um, this, the iPad is an incredibly accessible tool for this work. And I'm really grateful to Tain Maurice Andarajan for bringing this into our, um, our use and our consciousness. Um, and so you're going to see in the, the slides I'm about to show you that, that the girl using the iPad is vicariously identifying with the mastery and the competence of her older sisters that she's watching as she's filming it. And so this contributes, you know, filming contributes to her own growing competence. All right, I'm gonna do um, some screen share here quickly. Okay. So you see um, me working with these students and here Tani Ikeda is working with Davy, helping her play with the big camera and uh, Mercy down in the corner is holding the boom mic. And here we see the older students performing on stage. And in the right-hand corner, the younger students are filming them. And here's a close-up of that. And here you see kind of the double filming of the, iP the iPad being filmed. And here's, this is a camera that we gave them and they ultimately made their film on. And this is a scene actually from the um, the film itself. Okay, so yeah, Good. thank you for yeah. sharing those. Yeah, um, and I would actually um, for this next question, I would actually like to invite um, Aaron Page and Balu um, to join this conversation. Um, so this next question. Um, is actually about the parai itself. Um, so can you just maybe explain a little bit about the structure of this instrument, um, its drum patterns, and its uh, performative use in a cultural context? So like, for example, I noticed at least um, when watching the film that during the opening ceremony, there were two students that were playing the drum and they were playing um, specific patterns I noticed and they were kind of like alternating between a couple of them. So is this all um, improvised or are there like set, you know, is there a set order? Um, so mm -hmm. I'll take it, leave it for you guys to. Great. So I, I'm actually going to play you a pattern which are called adis. So the concept of tala, at least in, in all my research is not used here. I think sometimes I use the term, but the, the classical concept of tala isn't used. The term adi is most appropriate and it means a rhythmic pattern. I'm gonna play a pattern called tapatam and sometimes it's called temangu. Um, and it's a 12 unit pattern. Most of these are organized either into 12 units, eight um, or six, sometimes four. Um, and this is, so this is temangu and it's got its own mnemonic devices. So jen, jen, naku, di, naku, jen, 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 ju, naku, di, naka. It's got a four step dance pattern that fits in that 12. It's got a tune type and it's got a function. So it's an auspicious festival oriented pattern. 
And all of this comes together in, in what we might call a, a genre package of kind of intersectional arts. So I'm gonna play this pattern for you and hopefully it won't be too loud. <laughs> So that's Timangu, and it's it's a very fun, exciting pattern. Um, I could show. Let me just show a, a, a quick slide um, of some of these patterns. Let me go here, just to talk about the genres real quick. Okay, so. So when I was doing my research with the group Kurunji Maler, which was an all-male group um, that lived in the village of Munivendri near Paramaguri, Tamil Nadu, I learned 35 different patterns in four months. And there are I likely many, many more patterns than what I learned. So to just realize that that um, there are many more because a lot of people have said, oh, you know, there are only 35 patterns. Well, there's many more than that. But they, they have this this whole range of of auspicious occasions, especially that that these various genres are performed for. So um, deity possession, bullfighting, uh, pot dance, uh, karagam, um, film songs, folk various things like um, vale, vale kapu, which is the seventh month pregnancy when a woman is processed to her mother's house. Only three of these patterns we would consider inauspicious because they were played for funerals or sabu. So keep that in mind. Only three are inauspicious where there's this real um, stereotype that, that the parai is only played for inauspicious negative kinds of uh, occasions. So here's another set of them. And, and here you can see the rhythmic patterns um, the syllables Jen Janaka Jen Janaka or the Jen Janakudi Nakudi that I perform for you there in the hand. So let me go out of that and we'll go back to. So I'm I'm wondering if my my friends and colleagues could talk more um, about some of these issues. Bali, do you want to talk about the history of the Parai? Yeah. Yeah, great. Actually, uh, it's wonderful, uh, Zoe. So far, it sounds so great. And uh, the parai was always uh, mentioned as a auspicious instrument in uh, ancient Tamil literature. Uh, for instance, Tolkapiyam, uh, that was the uh, oldest Tamil uh, book. It talk about talks about the language and the culture of Tamil people. And uh, there are so many uh, information about music and all that. So Parai is mentioned in that Tolkapiyam and uh, other uh, Sangam literature poems also mentions that. But until uh, you know um, the caste system came into practice in uh, South India, especially in Tamil Nadu, uh, the Parai drum was used for everything to you know uh, inti inti intimate people uh, some information from kings or uh, you know like. Uh, they used to carry the news with the drum so that uh, you know they can play the drums very powerfully and then people will gather and uh, uh, heard the news from the king so that's how that uh, instrument used and not not for that not only for that for uh, many occasions for auspicious occasions it was used and later you know uh, after uh, you know this caste practice and came into this uh, country um, you know, that uh, parai was uh, considered as very, very low. Even the, the players of that instrument also considered very low in the society. Um, that's really bad. Uh, and, uh, you know, the name tapatam, so that means a wrong beat. So <laughs> uh, wrong dance or wrong beat. How can you say that to the beautiful music uh, as, uh, you know? Um, but in um, uh, I would like to mention about... Uh, uh, the music composer Ilai Raja, who comes from uh, you know um, uh, from a deep uh, south village, and uh, basically he was a he was born as a Christian, Daniel Rasaya, and he had a lot of music of uh, the village music. And then when he entered into film, and uh, of course he he is a master of everything. Like uh, he he is very good in Western Western music and Hindustani music, Carnatic music. And uh, you know any kind of music, it was master. And then he was able to introduce lots of lots of folk beats in movies. 
um for instance uh, there was a movie called devar mahan in that movie uh, a famous beat was uh, you know uh, even uh, everybody cherished that beat sandu pottu sandana pottu adukku ketuka ketuka mama for that din tada 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 din kita kita tada so that beat was very very popular and he introduced so many beats especially the three pulsed beat you know that's a folk uh, beats of uh, tamil nadu particularly and uh, one another th- uh, important thing i wanted to add uh, and uh, in uh, other states like uh, uh, karnataka or andhra pradesh in our neighbor states folk music you know uh, celebrated very high highly manner in only in tamil nadu uh, the folk musicians and the folk uh, arts are uh, considered very low it's really very really sad thing about that Paolo, thank you so much. Um, I, I wanted to jump in here uh, and, well, first, thank uh, everybody for, you know, um, uh, inviting me to, to join you. Thank you, Zoe Aka and Paolo, sir, as well, and Bianca for moderating. Um, you're thinking of Alea Raja and his contribution makes me think a little bit about the early history of Tamil cinema, um, pre-Alea Raja, and you do see the Parai uh, represented in Uh, early Tamil films, um, especially from the 50s, uh, Narodi Manan, it's a well-known MGR film. Yeah. And the Pare represented there. The curious thing is that in these earlier films, you see the instrument. It's visually represented. Yeah. You do not hear the instrument. The sound of the Pare is always erased. Yeah. Um, and replacing it is usually the sound of either a, a, a murudangam or a tabla. Um, but yeah. you don't hear the parai. And actually, you don't hear the sound of the parai really until the, the, the 70s um, yeah. with the rise of Alea Raja. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, 1976, his, his um, entry, his, his, his first film, uh, Anakili, right? Which, yes, yes. Um, he brought that kind of that folk um, sensibility to uh, the Tamil film world using the vernacular sounds themselves, mm-hmm. not just... Always- I always say that the the, the parai was unhearable. Mm. Yeah. As well as untouchable. Yeah. Mm. Right. Sorry Aaron, go ahead. No, no. And um just another thing I wanted to mention is the uh, and 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 Zoe Aka will talk about this uh as well um but the travels of the parai beyond uh Tamil Nadu. Um so I I spent a significant amount of time um in Malaysia um and there's a very uh strong Tamil folk uh tradition um practiced in Malaysia as well um yeah. you hear the and see the parai um in the southeast uh, asian tamil diasporas of Malaysia and Singapore um under the british a lot of dalits were um found their way to southeast asia uh voluntarily in some cases but quite often coercively as well and brought with them um their musical traditions and the parai and 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 its practice um kind of um uh, grew in other i guess new directions in Malaysia um uh there aren't as many parai groups today in Malaysia but there are other folk uh ensembles uh urumi in, in particular urumi melam which um shares a lot of uh similarity in terms of the adis that are performed um and there's a, a just a, a huge kind of um uh i would say uh growth of of new adis and beats being created um in the Malaysian diaspora um hundreds of beats and actually a lot of the new beats are coming out of Tamil film music um but are also referencing all kinds of other popular um musics including hip hop um mm-hmm. hip hop beats as well and those beats now are um cycling or are circling back to um to Tamil Nadu and they're actually influencing the development of of popular music and folk music there as well. Yeah. Great. So so well, let's go on and and um talk about the next question. Yes, of course. Um but before and I just would like to encourage you viewers out there that if you have any questions, um we're going to be taking them really soon actually. So feel free to ask any questions, ask away. Um so this one question I have for you um Zoe is so this isn't obviously your first time using film as a medium to present your research 
Um, so for example, your 2011 film, This Is In Music. Um, so as seen in your earlier film, there seemed to be this growing popularity of the Parai drum um, through events like the Chennai Sangam, Sangamam, excuse me. Um, so what is the status now, 10 years later, in the current political scene in Tamil Nadu and in the diaspora, excuse me? Yeah, yeah so this uh, uh, Parai drum has just really taken off the last seven years or so in the diaspora in the US and Canada and other, other parts of the world, London, uh, Australia, but even in the city of Chennai particularly, there's it's just been an amazing um, explosion of, of interest in this drum across caste particularly. Um, there's this event called Chennai Sangamam started in, I think it was 2005, Aaron, I think you might remember. And I think it lasted through like 2010. I think it was later than that. Really? I think it was 2007 or eight. I yeah. Think. Well, 2008 was the third year. Okay. Um, that's when I did my film. Fixed. But anyway, maybe Balu, you can talk to, about the support of the various government organizations for yeah. that event and, and what that did for folk musicians. Uh, yeah, actually, you know, in uh, 2006, I think uh, DMK uh, came to power and then they wanted to support folk artists, you know, uh, mm -hmm. until then, uh, you know, the government was supporting the uh, classical uh, arts like uh, Carnatic music and, uh, you know, uh, of course, um, they also supported films, but they didn't do anything for folk music until mm -hmm. 2006. In uh, uh, when uh, DMK government came to power and uh, the DMK Supremo uh, Karunanidhi and uh, his daughter was in a central government ministry and she wanted to, uh, you know, start something for uh, the society and the uh, father um, Casper. What's Gasparaj. 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 Yeah. And uh, he and uh, Kanimori, that is Karnanidhi's daughter, they started this festival. And I uh, get that, especially Chennai Sangamam, it's kind of a confluence of uh, music. It was a great, uh, um, you know, uh, opportunity to um, uh, bring the village guys to Ch uh, Chennai city. And uh, some of the musicians, they were, they performed with the Umayal Param Shivaraman. Mm -hmm. uh, you know the the famous uh, drummer in Carnatic music. Um, that was you know unbelievable. It was not happened in the history. Of course, mm -hmm. uh, in 1990, um, you know our uh, Wesleyan uh, alumni um, professor K. Subramaniam, he conducted a program, music program that is folk to classical. How classical music developed from the folk music. So uh, based mm -hmm. on that, my uh, my uh, you know friend. Uh, uh, classmate, uh, Dr. Pushpamanam Kupuswami, he was on the other one side and then uh, the classical musicians were on the other side. So they, uh, Kupuswami performed a particular composition and then the classical musicians, they sang the uh, Kritis, Carnatic Kritis, based on the raga that Kupuswami sang. Mm -hmm. So that was a beautiful, uh, you know, thing happened in 1990, but uh, this 2006 and to nine, it was like, uh, you know, all um, folk uh, folk musicians, they uh, came to Chennai and, uh, you know, that was three days festival during the Pongal time. And uh, every street, you know, it's filled with music and dance, you know, everybody was enjoying. But uh, the following uh, government, because of the political uh, reasons, the, they stopped this program. So yeah. that really, really, uh, you know, um, unfortunate for the folk musicians. Yeah. But what happened was, I mean, this really started this trend of uh, people mm -hmm. like um, Mani Maran, uh, who yes. I've been studying with his son recently. He started teaching people all over Chennai, any any men, women from any caste, etc., in mm -hmm. a very kind of um, Ambedkarite yeah. mm -hmm. um, ideology behind yeah. what he's doing. And he's one of the, I would say, the most amazing performer of this instrument um, alive today. Um, and then it became really big in the diaspora. So yeah. in the last seven years or so, in 2011, Shakti, this, this group that the, the, the film's about, came to the FETNA, which is the Federation of, um, of North Indian Tamil Sangams. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, um, 
and they came to the 2011 event in South Carolina. And this is where lots of Parai group of people became inspired and wanted to start Parai group. So the most well-known and, and really best one in the US is um, the group called the American Parai in St. Louis. Oh. And um, yeah, they're a, a terrific group. Um, Borcheri and my friend has been w working, you know, uh, is, is the leader of that group. So. Oh. So, but so many groups, Seattle, Connecticut, Manu Damparai, yeah. um, Minnesota, and so all over the country now. And I've been working with some of these, these American-based Parai groups to help try to raise funds to bring Shakti back in order to teach and perform. Um, there have been some, some teachers who come from India to, to work with them as well. But we're looking for collaborators to raise funds to, to do that, to really bring Dalits here to teach American uh, mm -hmm. Americans. Yeah. So yeah. I so guess we have a couple. Yeah, go ahead, Aaron. Yeah, I, I had a quick question for you, actually, um, about the the um, the Parai in the diaspora. And, and as the music has um, traveled and, and also as, as you um, bring it and 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 ensembles like Shakti bring it to um, the diasporic audience. Um, uh, sometimes the connection of the Parai to um, to Dalit uh, people and culture um, uh, is is not foregrounded um, mm -hmm. all, all at first, and it's uh, thought of as being first and foremost a Tamil um, mm -hmm. instrument. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about how you. Um, think about that issue and, and how you um, yeah. talk about that issue in your teaching. In your yeah, practice. so kind of the emphasis, the discourse, the emphasis in the diaspora that I've heard lots of people say is that this is our ancient Tamil instrument. And yes, we see this instrument. We don't know if it was the same exact instrument, if it was a different shape in in um, Sangam literature going back 2000 years, etc. But Tamil itself, the concept of Tamil has its own resonance, like the Tamil Isai movement, the, the, the Dravidian movement. And the problem with that is the erasure of untouchability. We yeah. can't erase the history of untouchability associated with this instrument. We want to reclaim it, its, its worth, its positiveness um, from its ancient roots. But we can't forget the experience of those Dalit drummers and and you know, in playing the, you know, in their duty, their village duty of playing this instrument. As we teach, you know, Tamil children in the diaspora, we can't just say it's a Tamil instrument. We need to teach its history, its proper history, so we can understand its its power and as a tool of liberation. And that's really what I'm trying to do with my with my films. Balu, you want to add to this? Yeah, I just wanted to say I feel uh, music movement and, uh, you know, they supported only the classical music. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, because they wanted to have Tamil composition on stage. So, um, and, uh, you know, the folk music, folk music has Tamil, Tamil uh, literature and beautiful uh, lyrics and all that, but they wanted to have only the classical music. That's very, that's also unfortunate. Yeah. 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 Well, and things are changing and that's a really beautiful yeah. thing. And I, I, I think, commend uh, now, now the uh, parai instrument is not like uh, graded as low. Now, I think it's getting popular, and uh, uh, and uh, nobody talks about bad about uh, uh, yeah. the instrument nowadays. Yeah, that's a good. Thing. So, in fact, with this might. Be, so, I'm yeah, just, we have a question in the chat that um, maybe we could go to. You want yep. to? Yeah, we have um, some actually uh -huh. some really great questions here. So, I'm going to start with the first one. Um, how are these rhythmic patterns taught? Who teaches and passes them on? Is there a connection to classical Parnatic Mirdangam yeah, so rhythmic like, patterns? So again, and this one's the kind term of Adi is really yeah. important. That that Adi and Tala are different systems. It, these mm. these patterns are taught, you know, kinesthetically and orally. You know, people pick them up. Student, you know, kids pick them up in the village by ear, of course, and they're going around jin janaka, jin janaka when they're little um, and they're playing on, on metal cans and pots and things like that. And then, uh, you know, they either, to a certain degree, I think formally come into a group. And uh, I saw a young man, you know, just be brought along to various events and, and, and you know, picked up, kind of thrown into it, you know, starting out playing the um, maracos or maracas 
uh, that kind of thing. And, and, you know, getting some, the technique is not easy. You have to practice, you have to be taught how to hold these sticks. And, and so, um, but it's all done, you know, orally. Although some folks are now writing things out. Um, some, some people are kind of trying to standardize some of the, the patterns. And yeah, regarding the connection to murdangam um, and the rhythms that are played on that instrument, uh, there are a number of folk musicians, um, not only parai players, but also uh, tavel artists and urumi drummers who um, actively cultivate skills in Carnatic rhythm. And they draw on those quite um, powerfully, creatively, and strategically in, in, in their playing. And that's not everybody. Um, but there's a good number of, of, of um, parai performers, drum, drummers, but, um, but also other drummers, who uh, folk drummers, um, who actively find access to Carnatic music, um, either through film or through study, informal study or formal study, generally not with Carnatic musicians, but with periamelum uh, musicians, uh, which is a, a kind of um, a, a ritual uh, devotional uh, music that you hear in, in the temple. Should we address that other question? Yeah, I think we have time to squeeze it in. Um, so this next question is, um, and last question for tonight's event. Um, does the name Parai of the drum have a connection to the word um, Parayan, which means a low caste person? Right. So the word Parai, if I'm pronouncing it right, means to speak or to announce in both Tamil and Malayalam. So that's the root of the word, right? And and the 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 job of announcing village ritual occasions, auspicious, inauspicious, came to this group of people who played the parai drum, and thus they were called pariyars. And but what we need to, you know, the, the parayan is a, an informal version of that. We want to say pariyar. Um, but it, again, with the history of untouchability in relationship to this, um, you know, th so that those people were announcers, they were drummers, they were announcers. And we know, I don't know, Paolo, I, I don't know if you um, agree with this date, probably around eighth, ninth century is when, you know, the, the caste system became really kind of codified in Tamil Nadu. Um, and so at that point, this, this negativeness got associated with that word. And ultimately the word, you know, pariyar is related to pariah, right? That's where the, the British took the term and they mispronounced it, put the accent in the wrong place and came up with pariah. Um, and so that's where we get our negative term. But the really important point here is that we go back to the term parai, which means to announce. It's a job. Yeah. It's, a, it's a really important job to announce what the king has to say. To yeah, the, 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 you know, the name Parayar, you know, even though they, they don't play the instrument, mm -hmm. they are not a Parayar, they become a caste later. Right. So, uh, you know, since they are working with the dead animals, you know, mm -hmm. like uh, uh, dead animal skin and uh, cleaning and everything's based on that uh, dead animals. So mm -hmm. it's uh, the, the caste, the, the person who, uh, involved making that instrument was also prior, and later the uh, the it became a caste, and then for the low caste people, and then uh, even though they anybody you know you know you know uh, uh, I don't know anything about this parai uh, you know like uh, uh, even though I'm an insider, you know I don't know much about this instrument and uh, you know the cultural background, but the Zoe is. Uh, very informative about this subject. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Balu. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, you know, we didn't get a chance. We were going to talk about some of the um, the issues that come up in the film and particularly the, the anger, uh, working with oppressed young people and helping them express their anger. And I really want to encourage everybody to watch the film in order to see um, the, that process of transformation. But I also want to recognize that you know, in the film, there, there's two different scenes where they're talking about just a newspaper articles about an incident of a Dalit woman, uh, Dalit girls being raped. And this is a very common 
um, incident in India, you know, um, the rape of Dalit women is, is all too common. And some of you might have heard about the 19 year old Dalit woman in um, Hadras, Uttar Pradesh, who was gang raped two weeks ago and died of her injuries just, I think, two days back. So um, I really want you to I really want you to um, watch the film in order to understand um, this process of, of what these young people are going through and how they're dealing with these issues in a really positive way. In a um, So thank you. I thank you. Um, so that concludes this event. Um, Zoe, I really thank you so much for um, sharing this wonderful film. And for the viewers out there, please, 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 you have till October 7th to watch it. I highly encourage it. Um, thank you so much, Aaron and Balu, of course, for thank joining you. us thank and you. providing your knowledge, thank of you. course. And with that, uh, have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, I really want to thank everyone. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Brian. Thank you.